Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And I am so thankful that he holds the whole world in his hand. Just when man thinks he's got everything all figured out, the good Lord shows us that uh, without him, we can do nothing. But we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, <laughs> how we thank you that uh, you sent your son. Father, at just the right time. Lord, when we needed you most, when we needed your son, and that perfect salvation that brought us that peace that passes understanding. Father, we thank you for the gift of grace that was poured out from the cross that day for all who would believe. Father, we thank you that we have that peace today. We have the rest that you have given us in our souls. And we thank you. Father, we just do pray for all of our brothers and sisters. Father, in Christ, wherever they may be throughout the earth today, we pray for your sweet blessing by your spirit that they would be lifted into heavenly places today. Father, that each one would realize what a treasure we have in these earthen vessels. Father, these vessels were not meant for eternity, but Father, one day we will spend eternity with you, and we look forward to that day. But Lord, in the meantime, as we listen to your words today, Father, may they just uh, go deep into our spirits, and may they uh, cleanse out the things that need to be washed out. And Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to take hold of the word of life. Lord, we know that your word declares and we see it to be so that there is coming a time on this earth when there will be a famine in the land, not of bread or water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. So Lord, we thank you today for the blessing of hearing your word. And may we not ever take it for granted. And we just thank you for the privilege you give us today. For we pray in Christ's blessed and precious name. Amen. Morning, church. Morning. All right. I think you guys have been getting a little bit too comfortable with my usual routine. So I'm going to change things up a little bit. And I'm going to change it up. Because we are in the Christmas season. So I'd like to uh, deviate a little bit from the announcements. I think everybody kind of has the understanding of where we're going to go get videos and all that other stuff and where we're going to mail our tithings. Um, I do want to call out a couple of anniversaries that are coming up. Uh, it's a happy anniversary for Jeff and Kaylin coming up on the 12th. And uh, mine's going to be tomorrow. Happy anniversary. 29 years. So I'm really excited, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a blessing every you know, when I look back at it, it's just, I can't believe it's been 29 years because it just, when you're married you're to your best friend, it's just awesome. So, but today I want to talk about Advent. So what is Advent? Advent is a season of four Sundays that mark the beginning of a new church year. The ancient Christian church celebrated Advent as a kind of fresh start to faith and worship. Advent is a time to anticipate and spiritually prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, our Savior, God's gift of love to us. At the same time, Advent anticipates and hopes for, the, for Jesus' glorious return at the end of the age. The word Advent comes from the Latin advenio, meaning coming or arrival. The traditional Bible readings for Advent teach how the prophets, the kings, and the forerunners prepared the way for the coming Messiah, which is really cool because in the Old Testament, some of those writings date back from 700 to 1,000 years before the birth of Christ. Many Christians celebrate Advent with a special time of devotions, including Bible reading, prayer, singing, and lighting candles on an Advent wreath. Growing up, I had an Advent wreath. We had one. Uh, never really understood what it was about. I mean, we did the candle thing, but we minus all the, the important stuff out of there, you know, <laughs> the preparation, you know, the prayers, the, the uh, you know, the singing, the Bible reading, all of that wasn't part of it. So 
The Advent wreath was developed in the 1500s as a way to mark the season of Advent, preparing for the coming of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. The wreath was made of evergreens and is usually placed in a table and spaces for four candles around the wreath, and then there was one in the center. Candles were often purple or blue, rose, I'm sorry, purple and blue, there was three of those. There was one rose, and then there was one white, the white being in the center. And uh, the symbolicness of those colors, uh, there was actually meaning to them. So purple was traditionally been the main advent color, symbolizing repentance and fasting. It's a royal color. Uh, purple looks forward to the reception of the coming of the king who is celebrated during Advent. Pink, or rose, is used during the third Sunday. It represents joy, the anticipation of the coming celebration. And white is the color of uh, the center candle representing Christ as the sinless, pure Savior. So it was really kind of a, a neat uh, thing to do every Sunday that of Advent. You would light one candle, and then you would recite scriptures and do prayer readings and such uh, in preparing. Um, so this past Sunday was, uh, was the first Advent. Uh, it was on the 29th. It came up on us really fast, and I, was, I wasn't anticipating it. So I'm going to go through, and I'm going to paraphrase a lot of what the, the first Advent was. It's considered the Advent of hope. Okay, just to catch us up, and then we'll talk about today's Advent, okay? But a little background. Um, the wonderfully familiar Christmas story that took place 2,000 years ago, but it was more than, uh, it was many more centuries in the making. In speaking through the ancient prophets, God foretold how he would bring his beloved son into the world. The birth of Jesus took place in a historical setting that the prophets foretold. The underlying story of his genealogy in itself was a divine masterpiece of intrigue, suspense, and prophetic fulfillment. But the quiet events of that first Christmas morning so long ago have become commonplace in our modern traditions. Wise men and shepherds are familiar uh, Christmas symbols as they gather around the tender baby who lies in a manger while a chorus of angels pro proclaims the Lord's goodwill to mankind. But how did the prophets envision this story? What hopes had they uh, formed in the hearts of men, and what is the hope to which we look? And so the first Sunday of Advent was, again, was 29th. It was the Advent of Hope. And let me paraphrase that down. So going back, in the fullness of time, God sent the angel Gabriel uh, uh, to Zacharias, a humble Levite pri priest who ministered before God at the temple in Jerusalem. And peering in a vision, the angel foretold the birth of John the Baptist, who would be sent to prepare the way for the Messiah. And with the coming of his forerunner, the first stirring of the Messiah's own coming was announced. For many centuries, the promise of the Messiah had tarried, but now, there's a real reflection here, but now the ancient hope was renewed and a sense of anticipation awakened for the opening was awakened. For the opening steps had begun, the Messiah was coming at last, and the world would be forever changed. Prophecies long dormant were springing to life before their eyes. In the sixth month, the angel was sent again, and this time to a young virgin named Mary, who was espoused to Joseph of the house of David, and in greeting her, he spoke of favor she had found with God. In Mary's genealogy, the seed of David had been preserved. And through her espoused husband, Joseph, the claim to David's kingdom, which had fallen long ago. And in the child she would bear, the two parts of God's ancient covenant would come together. Again, in one person at last. The angel told how the child would inherit the throne of David, his earthly forefather. But Mary was confused by his proclama proclamation. How could the angel speak of giving birth when she was still a virgin? How shall this be, she asked. So the angel foretold the virgin birth to her. For three months, Mary stayed with her cousin Elizabeth, to whom John the Baptist would be born. And when she returned to Joseph in Nazareth, her pregnancy was beginning to show. 
Joseph, not understanding what had taken place, naturally suspected the worst and considered ending the betrothal. But being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, he was minded to do this quietly. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to, be, to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is the Holy Ghost. From Matthew 1, 18 to 20. So that, can, that is the advent of hope, which brings us into today's advent, advent of peace. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through these uh, passages, and I'm going to call out Old Testament and New Testament. So you can see and compare and contrast the prophecies that were given back 700 to 1,000 years being fulfilled in the New Testament that was written after Jesus' birth. In a, in a world of trouble and doubt, human hearts yearn for peace, yet it ever eluded them. For true peace begins with God, and it is well beyond their means to achieve it. Comfort and joy, darkness and dread hung together in the balance, and only the Lord himself could tip the scales in our favor. On behalf of a lowly man came, came a lowly yet sinless Savior to redeem us all and bring forgiveness and reconciliation with God. In times of great peril, the peace he gave us would arise from within himself. The nation stirred with trouble as his coming drew near. So New Testament, and it, and it came to pass in those days that there would be a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. That's Luke 2, 1. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went, to, went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Luke 2, 3 through 6. Old Testament. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrath, <laughs> thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judea, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Micah 5.2 But when they came to Bethlehem, no room was made for them at the inn. So Mary brought forth her first son, firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, as it was spoken by the prophet. Old Testament. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know him. My people doth not consider. Isaiah 1.3. New Testament. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were sore afraid. Luke 2, 8-9. Old Testament. Arise, shine. Or the light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over thee, and his glory will be seen upon thee. Isaiah 61 through 2. New Testament. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Luke 2, 10 through 14. This fulfilled the words of Isaiah, Old Testament. Seeing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done, hath done it. Shout ye lower parts of the earth, 
Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest and ye tree therein. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Isaiah 44, 23. New Testament. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said unto one another, Let us now go to, unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had it seen it, they had made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning his child. And all that the, that all and all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told by them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Luke two, fifteen through nineteen. That was the advent of peace. So. I know this year has been tough, um, but I sincerely hope that the hope and the peace that you would find only in the Lord will find your hearts this year, this Christmas season. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pastor. Amen. Susan, are you taking the little ones? Okay. The young ones can go with Susan. And you old ones that are here can turn in the book of Acts, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In his book entitled America on Six Rubles a Day, the comedian Yakov Smirnov writes this. He says, coming from the Soviet Union, I was not prepared for the incredible variety of products available in American grocery stores. While on my first shopping trip, I saw powdered milk. You just add water, you get milk. Then I saw powdered orange juice. You just add water, and you get orange juice. I saw powdered eggs. You just add water, and you get eggs. And then I saw baby powder. <laughs> what a country. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if it were that easy? Of course, uh, wouldn't it be great if uh, you could just do that for church, too, making disciples? Just add water, and you can add disciples to the church. Well, the way we've seen church growth, adding disciples seemed to have been pretty easy. We've seen mass evangelism, and the church has just exploded. But you know, not everyone can preach to the masses like Peter and Philip. Today we're going to see one man talking to one man about Jesus. And this one man is going to be genuinely converted. In contrast to what we saw last time where Simon, you remember Simon the sorcerer, he made a profession of faith, but Peter confronted him and his faith turned out to be fraudulent. And uh, talking to one person about the Lord Jesus Christ is something that we can all do. Of course, it's something that we should all be doing. Remember, Peter wrote in his first epistle, but sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. I remember reading Dr. Bill Bright's book, Witnessing Without Fear, a long time ago. It was one of the first books on evangelism that I ever read. And in that book, he made a statement that only about 5% of evangelical believers ever share their faith 
through personal evangelism. He said that people feel more comfortable inviting unbelievers to church so that they can hear the gospel. Or they'll invite them to some special event where they'll hear an evangelist share the gospel. Most of us would rather let the pastor or some professional share the gospel because, frankly, a lot of people just don't feel qualified. They're afraid that they might get asked a question, and they, uh, they would rather somebody who's more knowledgeable or more qualified share the faith. When Billy Graham was alive, naturally a lot of people would bring their unsaved friends to hear him. Of course, now he's not around anymore, so they would rather take them to see his son Franklin or maybe Luis Palau or uh, uh, Greg Laurie or some other evangelist. Um, but, uh, but I really want to encourage you this morning, uh, you may not think that you're qualified, you may not think that you're able to share your faith, but you really are. You know what you did to get saved, and so therefore you know what it takes. And so you really need to understand that you can you can do one-on-one -on -one evangelism. Billy Graham told a, about a time early in his career when he arrived at a small town and he had to go to the post office, but he didn't know where it was. So he found a young lad and he asked this young boy if he could tell him where the post office was. And so he told him and Dr. Graham thanked him and he said, young man, if you'll come to the Baptist church this evening, you can hear me tell everybody how to get to heaven. And the young boy said, well, I don't think so, sir. You don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> well, we've seen Philip the evangelist preaching to crowds in Samaria, doing many miracles and seeing many people come to faith in Christ. And, of course, we've also seen Simon the pretender faking the faith, wanting to buy the power of the Holy Spirit and how Peter exposed his faith as fake, and the early church fathers tell us that he was the, one of the founders of Gnosticism, one of the first heresies that came to the early church. There will always be pretenders, those who say they're Christians, believe they're Christians. Uh, last Tuesday, we talked about many of the cults that exist. Uh, what qualifies as a cult, one of the things that qualifies as a cult is that they believe they're Christians. They claim to be Christians, but there are some, uh, there are some quirks to their doctrine that uh, disqualify them as genuine Christians. And God's going to sift them out on the day of judgment. We, uh, today we're going to see how God used Philip to lead an Ethiopian eunuch, a Gentile, but a seeker of truth, a seeker and a believer in the God of Israel. And he would come to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And from this encounter, we're going to learn ourselves some principles about evangelism so if you look in your Bibles to verse 26, and we're going to read through, the end, read through to the end of the chapter. And you can follow along with me as I read. Luke writes, Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go to the south, along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. 
the place in the scriptures in which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers silent. So he opened not his mouth in his humiliation. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. All right, well, let's pray before we continue on, all right? Our Father, I pray that the Spirit of God would give us eyes to see and understand. Lord, we, uh, we pray that you would speak to us now in these moments, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so church growth now has gone from Jerusalem to, to Judea, and of course through persecution it has spread north up into Samaria. And today we're going to see it begin to stretch to the uttermost parts of the earth as it goes south, and we observe Philip's witness to a foreign dignitary from Ethiopia. Israel had always been chosen of God to reach the nations. Remember, God told Abraham that through him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And of course, we believe that God was referring to the gospel and that Jesus Christ would be the means of the whole world being blessed. Of course, uh, Israel has been set aside for the time being because they rejected Christ. John tells us in his gospel that Jesus Christ, he came into his own his own people, Israel, and his own received him not. And then he goes on to say, but as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the sons of God. So for the time being right now, God has set Israel aside, and he is now using Gentiles. The church is primarily made up of Gentiles. Now, in the beginning, they were made up of mostly all Jews. And then gradually... As Gentiles became the primary makeup of the church, Jews were set aside, and now the Gentile church, there are Jews still within the church. They are believing Jews, many of them. And uh, one day, though, at the appointed time, he's going to turn his attention to Israel and deal with them, and then one day they will have their eyes open, and they will see that Jesus Christ is indeed the promised Messiah, and they will call upon him whom they have pierced, according to the prophets. But for right now, he's using Gentiles mostly to reach the world. But this noble from Ethiopia, Ethiopia he becomes the first Gentile a non-Jew to become a Christian. Now, this whole issue of Gentiles in the church, it will become an issue, and we will see how the church will deal with that as we move into, uh, as we move farther into the book of Acts, and we'll see it become an issue that will once and for all be settled in the first church council in Acts chapter 15. But we're not going to deal with that until we get there but this is the first example of one person leading another person to the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. And there are quite a few interesting things for us to see about this encounter. So let's see what we can learn from Philip. 
about one-on-one evangelism. First of all, there are some principles that we learn in personal witnessing. The first principle that stands out is the principle of guidance. You need to remember that salvation is God's work. It must always be initiated by God because on his own, man's not going to seek God. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 6 and verse 44 that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. The Father begins to work in people's hearts and then he sends someone to that person with the answers. And he delights to guide a faithful servant using them as his instrument. That's what's happening here. Philip was already faithful serving And he's going to use Philip as the instrument to bring the gospel to the eunuch. When a man or a woman is filled with the Spirit, they will usually be sharing their faith. And when they have the opportunity, talking about Jesus, that's one of their favorite things to do. Talking about Jesus. And Jesus told his disciples in John 16 and verse 14, he said, the Spirit of God, he says, he will glorify me for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so if you have a passion to talk about Jesus, he's going to lead you to certain people who are seeking. But they're seeking because God's working in their heart. God had already been working in this eunuch's heart. And he'll orchestrate your schedule and circumstances so that you can talk to the people that he has been drawing to himself. Now, God had already moved Philip to Samaria. So God will guide those who are already faithful serving to him to the people whose hearts are being prepared. Now, Mark, I need you as an as a example. Come here, I need a volunteer. Come here. I, I, you guys know Mark. He is my brother-in-law. Come up here. Those of you that are on Facebook, this is my brother-in-law, Mark. Say hi to the people on Facebook, Mark. Hello. <laughs> Hola. Hola. Uh-huh. Now let me just say, Mark is standing here doing nothing. Hello. <laughs> now if Mark's standing here doing nothing, then uh, I can't, he's not going anywhere. And if I want him to do something, I'm going to have to give him a, a push. I'm going to have to, if I want him to go anywhere, I have to point him in the right direction and then push him. That's how it is. If God wants him to do something, he's going to have to point him in the right direction and push him to get him to do something. <clears throat> it's unlikely that God is going to do that with somebody. If somebody's not doing anything... He's probably not going to use them. But if Mark is moving, if you're walking in a certain direction, go ahead. It's God's going to, he just put his hand on him and point him in the direction that he wants him to go. Does that make sense? Thanks, Mark. Good job. We are to make disciples as we are going. If we're busy serving then God is just going to put his hand on us and he's going to direct us in the the way that he wants us to go. That's what he did with Philip. Philip was already busy in Samaria, and so God had the angel speak to him, and then he had the Spirit speak to him. He takes those who are already faithful and he guides them to where he wants them to serve. So here's, here's the point that we need to get. If we've never led anybody to Christ, it might very well be because we've never shared the gospel with anybody. So if we're busy being faithful to the Lord, then God can lead us to somebody that needs to hear it, that's looking. God will guide us to the person that he's been preparing God used an angel, first of all, to direct Philip in verse 26. He told him to leave a fruitful ministry and go to the road from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. 
go to a place where there's not very many people. And here's something to note about how God leads. Sometimes it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It sounds a little irrational. Why would God have Philip leave a ministry where a lot of people are getting saved to go to a place where there's hardly going to be anybody? On a hot desert road. Why does he have to leave a ministry to the many to minister to the one? We don't really know. But we do need to remember something that Isaiah said. Isaiah 55, 6, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. <laughs> Some things are just better left to God. God sends him to one key individual. And Luke reveals that this Ethiopian eunuch is seeking after the one true God, which means that God has been drawing him he was the minister of finance for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. So this powerful dignitary was on his way home after returning from worshiping the God of Israel. And he's reading from the prophet Isaiah. Now, if he was in Jerusalem, here's another thing that doesn't make sense. Why didn't he just send Peter to him while he was in Jerusalem? That would have been a whole lot more efficient, <laughs> May, you know, that's another question that we just have to save it for when you get to heaven. We have to realize that, you know, God doesn't fashion his uh, efficiency model after the American work model. God has a different way of doing things than we do. Anyway, Philip sees the eunuch in his royal caravan, and the Holy Spirit says to him, go catch up to him. So Philip was faithfully serving and willing to go wherever the Lord would lead him, which brings us to the second principle, and that is obedience. The angel said, go south to the desert, and he left a successful ministry right away. No ifs, ands, or buts. He just went. And then the Spirit told him, catch up to the eunuch. And verse 30 says, he ran. No hesitancy, no reluctance. It took boldness to run up to a royal caravan. And he obeyed immediate, immediately. And you know, we, we pray and we ask God for boldness. And we typically wait for boldness and courage. And we pray and we wait and we think it's going to hit us like a bolt of lightning and we pray and we wait and we pray and we wait and we pray and we wait and it never comes God wants to fill us with boldness and as we and it never comes and we need to realize that we just need to go and the boldness comes as we go and if we wait till we feel feel like it it never comes I can't begin to tell you how many people have not heard the gospel because we haven't obeyed I don't even want to think about how many people that haven't heard because I chickened out Because I remain silent. I just know that God wants our obedience. Because when we're obedient, he'll use us. Then notice Philip's attentiveness. When he caught up to the eunuch, he heard him reading the scriptures aloud. That was customary. And guess what he's reading? In the middle of the desert, he's reading Isaiah 53. Now, that was an open door if ever there was one. <laughs> now, if we want to be an effective witness, we need to learn 
to be sensitive, to listen. What's going on as people speak? Be attentive. Determine if their heart is even open to the gospel. Someone's reading the Bible. That's an open door. Someone is sharing their pain and their fears with you. That's an open door. Someone's opening up to you about the guilt that they feel or their pain. That's an open door. Someone is talking about some sin and the guilt. Listen, you know, I've learned through the years, too, that not everyone is open to the gospel. We need to we need to learn to discern. You may not believe this, but there are times when we don't need to share. It's not always easy, and and that's why it's important for us to to be filled with the Spirit, because the Spirit can give us that discernment when it's when it's time to speak and when it's time to be quiet. Philip was an effective evangelist because he knew how to flow with what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. And he was truly led by the Spirit, not by whims and feelings. And and then, of course, when the opportunity presented itself, he was ready. When he arrived, he heard the eunuch speaking or reading Isaiah 53. Now, there was no way that that just happened traveling along a desert road, reading Isaiah 53. God prompted him to read that as he prompted Philip to be there at just the right time. That wasn't a coincidence. Philip knew the scriptures well enough to be able to explain it. Remember 1 Peter Chapter 3, verse 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason, who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he was ready to explain who Christ is and what he did from the scriptures. And we should be ready too. Because we are tools that God wants to use in presenting the gospel. We are like gloves. And the Holy Spirit is the hand that wants to fill the glove. Now let's see what it takes to maximize our presentation for an effective witness. There are two key ingredients. The first, it must come from the Word of God. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) The eunuch didn't understand what he was reading, but that only showed that he had a hunger to know God. Philip asked if he understood, and he said, how can I unless... Someone explains me, unless somebody guides me. And so he invited Philip to come up and talk to him about it. Now, that in itself is pretty exciting. I can just imagine Philip was coming out of his skin, because here he is being invited to come up and sit in a royal chariot. He already ran up. You know, to do that, he had to be risking his life. You don't just run up to a royal chariot, you know, and, and, and think that you're just going to come. There had to have been guards around the chariot and everything. And so that was pretty risky. So uh, God's hand was all over this, and he must have been rejoicing with confidence because you just don't run up to a royal chariot. He's a royal treasure after all. Anyway, this is what the eunuch was reading. Isaiah 53 and verse 6 and 7. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before his shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. 
In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And who would, uh, and, and the eunuch asked, is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Now, obviously, he's confused as he's reading this. Because the Jews taught that this was a reference to either the nation or the prophet Isaiah himself. And there was some teaching that it was a reference to the Messiah, but they just would not recognize that Jesus was the Messiah. But verse 35 says, Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. And God led the eunuch to one of the clearest evangelical passages in the Old Testament. Now you've got the New Testament. So you really, really got an advantage over Philip. And if we're going to make an effective presentation of the gospel... You need to take that person to the word of God. But you also should be able to explain it. Now that doesn't mean you have to know a whole lot of theology, although that would help. But you need to know the basics of the gospel. One of the things that marked the apostles after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ as they were preaching was their knowledge of the scriptures. You remember those first couple of sermons that we looked at? They were quoting the Old Testament left and right. I mean, my goodness, it was just mind-blowing how much scripture they, they put into their sermons. They used the word of God, and you'll find two things about that, about the scriptures when you use it. Number one, there is power and authority in God's word and not your words. For the word of God is living and, act and powerful and sharper than two, any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. The word of God is itself alive and it gives life. 1 Peter 1.23 says that we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Romans 10.17 says, says, um, What does it say? Faith comes by hearing. Sorry. Had a brain freeze there. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Alzheimer's is starting to set in, I'm afraid. Oh, my goodness. So, you know, one of the, one of the marks of Billy Graham's effectiveness in his sermons, his sermons, if you listen to some of his sermons, they were so simple. But over and over his sermons, you can hear, the Bible says, the Bible says, quoting scripture, there's the power. Then secondly, any rejection will be of the word of God, not you. Their argument is with God. I remember, I remember wit the first time I witnessed to my sister, and I've said this before, you know, when I would quote John 14, 6, I, I would say, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. And, and Monica would say, Mike, don't you think that's awful narrow-minded? And I said, well, yeah, I guess it is, but Jesus said it, not me. <laughs> so, so the argument is with him. And that's the case with the Word of God. Then, the second ingredient for an effective gospel presentation is it must center on the Son of God. When you know the Word of God, you'll discover that Jesus is a central theme. 
In John chapter 5 and verse 39, Jesus said to the Jews, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And then in verse 46, he says, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And Jesus is a central figure of scripture and redemption. It's through him. Any message apart from Christ and his sacrificial death and subsequent resurrection is not a gospel message. It's another gospel. And again, going back to our study on Tuesday, one of the, one of the primary tactics of the cult is they mess up the gospel message. They preach another gospel. So any effective witness must start wherever they are and you use the scriptures to bring them to Jesus. So the first thing is to get them to the scriptures. Secondly, you want to get them to the Savior. Now let me just say something, uh, give a word about personal testimonies. They definitely have their place. They can be a powerful element in any gospel presentation. The Apostle Paul, if you read through the book of Acts further on as we get down into the past the 20th chapter. Um, he uh, does an excellent job giving his testimony. He uses them very effectively. But uh, you want to be very careful not to get caught up in you because the gospel presentation is not about you. It's to be about Jesus. And, and we don't want to get wrapped up in telling about us. You know, it's great what God has done for us. <laughs> but, but sometimes we can glory a little bit too much in our previous depravity. And so we need to be careful to stay away from that. Make sure you explain clearly who Jesus is, why Jesus is the only way, and what they need to do to be saved. So first, get them to the Scripture. Secondly, get them to the Savior. Thirdly, get them to the way of salvation. Then, in verses 36 through 40, the profession of faith that you hope to see. First of all, before I say anything about the one who is hearing the gospel, let me say something about the expectation of the one who is sharing the gospel. Have faith that you can be effective in sharing the gospel. Share it like you expect that person to respond with faith. God wants to use us. You know, don't, don't, you wouldn't want to get saved, would you? I did that. My first, the first guy I led to the Lord, Artie Bartlett, that's exactly how I led him to the Lord. And it just blew me away. I just said, you know, if I had been working on him for a whole week because we, we, I worked at Westinghouse and we had work partners because we uh, were enclosed in these, uh, We worked in um, a nuclear power plant, we were, and uh, we were in closed fixtures. And so there were two of us working together in a, in a big uh, shell. And so as I'm talking to Artie all week long, he was a party animal, and I was a brand-new Christian. And so the last night that he got saved... I just finally came out and said to Artie, I said, Artie, come on, man, you wouldn't, you, really, you wouldn't want to get saved, would you? And he said, yeah, I would. I said, you would? I said, really? And he did. He prayed with me, and it just blew me away. I wasn't expecting it. But uh, so, you know, I just learned that, you know, need to have a little faith when we're sharing. So anyway, um, have faith 
that God can use you as you share the gospel. Don't be pushy. Don't be obnoxious. But have faith as you share. So uh, quickly, let's look what happened to the eunuch. First of all, genuine faith is confessed. It's interesting that the eunuch said in verse 36, he says, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Now, since they were in the desert, I doubt if Philip expected that they were going to come upon water. So more than likely, as he was explaining the gospel, he was saying, you know, when we get to Gaza, we, we might want to find a, a pool of water and baptize you because that's going to be your first act of obedience uh, as, a new, as a new believer. And uh, so lo and behold, they're traveling along and the, the eunuch says, look, there's water. What, what prevents me from being baptized? And so Philip says, well, you can if you believe in your heart. And so the eunuch says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so, okay. So, now I want to point out something here about verse 37. Now, a clear confession of faith has been a traditional baptismal formula. We did that with Jennifer and we did that with Connor a few months ago. And on their profession of faith, we baptized them. That was one of their first opportunities to be obedient to the Lord. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not untrue. But in most of the ancient manuscripts, verse 37 does not appear. If you have an NIV or a New American Standard, you won't find it in those translations. And in most, if you have a study Bible, you will probably have that note in there. But it certainly can be assumed and believed. So I just want to point that out. But he immediately demonstrated his faith by obedience. So genuine faith is going to be confessed. And genuine faith is going to be obedient. And verse 38 and 39 tells us that they both went down into the water and they came up out of the water. Now let me ask you this. How in the world can you get baptism by sprinkling <laughs> coming up out of the water? So, so anyway, baptism is the believer's first opportunity to demonstrate their obedience to their new master. And then thirdly, Genuine faith rejoices. The eunuch never saw him again. But he went on his way rejoicing. Because when you know that God has saved you, something happens inside. You feel cleansed. You feel the guilt and the shame that's been removed. He has redeemed you. He has made you a new creature in Christ. You you know that you now are a child of God. You've been adopted as a, as a son. And so you ought to be rejoicing. Now this is completely contrary to what we've seen with the conversion of Philip. Or Simon, rather. Genuine salvation is going to bear fruit. By obedience, by joy... And that doesn't mean everything is going to be hunky-dory all the time. But genuine conversion, there will be a lot of evidence to see. And here we see the eunuch rejoicing. Now, there's, there's one other thing here. It says, now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Whoa, wait, what's that? <laughs> the Spirit transported him. God snatched him up. <laughs> the rapture. He was instantly transported because it says, verse 40 says, but Philip was found in Azotus. 
And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. He disappeared, and he instantly appeared in Azotus, 20 miles away. And that's amazing. And Philip carried on his ministry, traveling northward up to Caesarea with all the ministry assignments that the Spirit of the Lord led him to. Can you imagine what the, what the eunuch must have been thinking? They come up out of the water and all of a sudden, pfft, Philip's gone. Wow. There's no doubt in his mind that he just experienced a God thing. <laughs> According to one of the church fathers, Irenaeus, the Ethiopian eunuch became a missionary to Ethiopia. So while Philip left Samaria to witness to one man, in essence, he reached a whole nation. Pretty cool, huh? You never know who it is you're sharing with. When you lead one person to Christ, you just might be witnessing to the next Billy Graham. You never know. I hope we all let the Lord use us to share Christ. Learn how to share one-on-one -on -one and see what God will do. We may never know this side of eternity. So... Put it in God's hands and see what he does. Let's pray. Father, we are in awe at your word. It is your truth. Thank you for these models in the early church and these encounters that teach us and challenge us how to live, how to serve, how to witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, may we be the instruments that you can use to make Christ known in this sin-darkened world. Use us, Lord, for your glory and honor. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you that are on Facebook and YouTube, I want to thank you for joining us too. And for you who are believers, I trust that you'll let the Lord use you to share your faith in Christ. You'll never know how God can use you either. And if there's anything we can do to help you, um, you have the information there to uh, contact us. So please let us know if we can help you. And uh, Trust that uh, you'll let us know. God bless you. Lord willing, we'll see you again next week.